you again for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's so funny because I, um, uh, you know, you sign up because you want to be helpful and you want to contribute and then you realize maybe I've gotten in over my head. <laughs> but I think I uh, have an experience that um, you all will find useful and, and interesting. Um, and it really, these, this is really a talk of best practices, things that I've found to have been useful uh, to in my career uh, progression, and I hope you'll find that to be the case as well. Um, so a disclaimer, um, I have endeavored to align this talk with the spirit of the Hidden Norm series uh, at, that's being presented here by the Latinx Mathematicians Research Community. Uh, but all that being said, I am here representing myself. <laughs> all the views and opinions expressed here today are mine alone, uh, or I've given a reference, but uh, they do not re necessarily reflect those of anyone else or any other entity. Uh, so I'm speaking on, on my own behalf, not the Department of Defense, no one else but Carla Cutright Williams. Uh, so my goal is to respect all views shared today, uh, and I hope to receive the same consideration. Uh, a few years ago, I had a chance to attend uh, the National Society of Black Engineers uh, National Conference and, uh, in Kansas City. It's one of the first conferences I attended as an undergrad. And I heard uh, a great speaker, Merle Evers Williams, who is the widow of Megar Evers, who is a, um, was a, uh, a civil rights activist. And uh, one really interesting thing, he was, um, he was the first African-American to apply to the University of Mississippi uh, for admissions, student, admissions as a student, uh, but he was denied that um, uh, opportunity. And um, I graduated from the University of Mississippi with my PhD. So it's just really interesting to have that connection uh, to this family. But um, during her talk, uh, she spoke to the theme of learning to play the game. And what I took away from that, and it's really stuck with me for uh, the last you know, few decades, is that um, you know, there are some, some norms, there are some standards that we, we, we have to uh, not abide by, but accommodate, right, if we want to be in, in certain arenas. And that's the game part of it, right? You learn the rules, you learn if you're playing basketball, you know there's um, a certain number of players on the court, you have to know the rules, you know, what does it mean to be uh, traveling? Um, what are the scoring options and all that? So, you know, learning to play the game means that you know the rules, you understand the, the bounds of the realm that you're working in or you're playing in. And so I, it's, it's kind of stuck with me the, all these years because I felt like, it gave me an approach to dealing with an environment such as the math community environment, uh, one that's difficult and, and can be a challenge to navigate. Uh, but I found that taking the approach of saying, not necessarily that it's a game trivial, you know, in this sense, but that I would learn the rules, learn how to uh, be whatever's deemed as best, right? If you're playing basketball, earning the most scores is important or supporting your teammates to earn their, their top scores. Uh, and so you learn, learn the value system of that arena that you're working in. And so that's how I view, uh, have viewed my career over these years. So as mentioned today, we will not only affirm students' intrinsic, intrinsic value, we will also provide ways in which they can, you can develop a professional image that best highlights your authentic self. Uh, we will address how to think about program application materials, email communications, uh, websites, professional photos, uh, business cards, et cetera. Okay. And so I hope you like that you have value in the absolute value signs there. <laughs> so like I mentioned, I, I signed up, right? Because uh, Pam, you, you know, you reached out and said, well, you know, please consider this opportunity. And I was excited to be a part of it, but I said, hmm, what do I have to bring to this? What value could I possibly bring to this? Uh, and, you know, the first thought was, well, when I was at uh, Cal State University of Long Beach, where I received my undergraduate degree, uh, I was academically disqualified. <laughs> and uh, this is the statement from the um, uh, undergraduate catalog. It says that students who have been placed on academic probation and do not raise their CSULB cumulative GPA on all courses at CSULB uh, and their overall, okay, so you see all that, right? So I was on probation for more than two semesters 
uh, academic probation for more than two semesters and I was kicked out. Uh, and so I, I tell my story because, you know, people can relate to it. I'm not saying everyone's failing out of college, but I find that um, this makes me relatable and that at that time, it was a brand, right? Because the department and my, the faculty knew, <laughs> you know, I was on academic probation and I had to overcome that view, right? And the only way to overcome that view was to, um, you know, improve my grades uh, and progress as a regular matriculating student. Uh, and, you know, it's hard to do. Math is hard, right? It's a difficult subject uh, and it's not necessarily, it hasn't always been an inclusive subject. It has not always been a field where uh, everyone um, feels like they're a part of that community. And so uh, it, it was tough, right? So I had to uh, find advocates, find allies in the department, uh, and then also find folks in my own community who would just be encouraging. They may not know math, they may not really appreciate and relate to any of it, of the math part, but they know what it means to stick it out. They knew what it meant to, you know, buckle down, do the work and move forward. And so I reached out to all of those folks in my community from, like I said, my professors to uh, my religious leaders, because I was very active in church growing up um, and just friends, right? So telling me to keep, keep going. And I found, I, I believe that th that experience and transcend, transcending beyond that uh, makes me a, a, the right person to talk about today. <laughs> so here I am, so I'm glad to be here. Uh, moving forward. So, you know, ha having failed out of college uh, can leave you with a feeling of less than, right? Um, I, you know, you look at people in class, it seems like people learn really quickly and they um, seem to grasp the concepts very quickly without any effort, right? Like in class, they just get it. And uh, I really th remember thinking about uh, real analysis, my first introduction to, you know, proofs, even that class. Um, it was a struggle for me, right? And probably similar to many of you. And I was like, well, I see these other people really doing well. They can just blast out a proof with no problem. Maybe it's me. Uh, and so, you know, my I had value, self-esteem issues, value issues. Like, am I really capable of doing this, this math? And, you know, it's easy to feel like I'm less than and not able to, and I don't have the worth of a good math student. Um, and that led to self-doubt. And I like this picture here, you know, maybe it'd be easier if we put this down. So it was a lot easier once I got over feeling less than. Um, and, you know, granted, there were plenty of folks around me who, um, you know, encourage me to say, hey, you are, you are enough um, to do this, this, this task that's before you. But I had a good number of folks that said, maybe you're not cut out for this, right? <laughs> um, and that's easy to do as well, because, you know, there's a certain standard that you need to maintain as a student. Um, I mean, yeah, they say C's get degrees, but, uh, you know, if you want to get into a graduate school or you most, not necessarily all jobs are looking at your grades necessarily, although they, they do request transcripts. Um, you know, you can really feel like you need to determine your value uh, based on those grades and based on your performance. Um, but I will say that despite all of that, you know, you are valuable as a human, as a person. And so even if you never ever finish, and I hate to say this to any math faculty on here, but as a student, if you decide to leave, uh, you know, uh, and go get a different kind of degree, not a math degree, or even if you don't finish college, and I'm not advocating for either one of these, but you can still live a full and, and healthy and you know, prosperous life, right? But the point is, is that it's not the end of the world if you, have, if you stumble somewhat at, through your math uh, journey as an undergrad, or even as a grad student, really. Um, uh, and even now as a, as a math professional, you, know, you may stumble, but it doesn't take away from who you are as a person. So definitely keep that in mind, um, because I, I think it's really easy to internalize the learning experience and say, well, if I'm, if I'm not getting it, it means that I'm not quite good enough. And that's not the case. Um, so don't, don't let that be one of the things that uh, holds you back. And if you need help, get help. 
Okay, so that's just a little side note, not quite on topic, but I think it's important to share. And these are things that, uh, that I have had to coach myself through, you know, to remind myself uh, as I've gone through these many years of ups and downs. Uh, just recently, I had uh, I've finished a book, The Confidence Gap, and it was actually recommended uh, to a group of us um, at work who, um, you know, deal with imposter syndrome, right? It's, it's one of those things where, you know, I think it happens a lot within um, STEM communities, uh, happens a lot with women, especially in STEM, uh, where you think that, you know, you're, you're going to get found out. You're going to be found out that uh, maybe you don't know enough, or it seems like you may not know enough. And you know, you're just given a, a PhD because uh, just for the sake of giving out PhDs, uh, but that's not the case, right? Uh, and so I really, this is one main line that I took from this book uh, was that actions of confidence come first. Feelings of confidence come later. So do those things that will build your confidence. If you are not the best uh, studier, you know, studying for classes, study more. Get, seek out help on how you can improve your studying skills. If you um, say like, you know, I mentioned proofs earlier. If you're not a proofs person, go get help. As you become better at that, then you'll feel more confident at it. Uh, and that's the same thing with public speaking uh, or even, you know, any kind of, of, of job, you know, you'll feel better about it once you start to do the action. Okay. Uh, and I, I didn't ask this. Should I take? I see there are comments in chat. Should I take any of those? Um, Completely up to you. If you want okay. to, if there's questions, I'm also happy to relay them to you. Okay. 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 Um, all right. So I just saw this, the little light, and I didn't want to miss anybody. Okay. Uh, but I will take questions or comments. Uh, well, questions, maybe not comments initially, um, but we'll have time for comments later. Okay. So. Um, but yeah, this is a really great one. And it, it even helps me to today, you know, to think there are things I could do better and there are things I'm working at doing better at. And I don't, but I still don't always feel confident about that. Is this the best? Well, I know if I put my best into it, if I take time uh, to, to um, you know, invest in time and, and put in the time to prepare, then I'm doing my best. So I like this phrase. Uh, it's a great book. Uh, Check it out if you're interested. Next. Uh, I don't know who said this. Uh, it is not Anna Sabrino, the author of Career, uh, the Creator Career, but I've always been, I've been told comparison is the thief of all joy. Uh, so if you think about it, if you are comparing yourself to the next student over who seems to you know, be really smart, or if you compare yourself to the skinniest person, or if you yeah, compare yourself to the person with the longest hair or the cutest, whatever, um, you know, it's really easy to become down and sad and unnecessarily, um, and, and you lose focus. And so I, I really appreciated this um, author's point of view. She says, by comparing ourselves to who started earlier, who are smarter, richer, it's easy to think we're less than. This feeling is not this feeling of not being enough does not have to paralyze us, which I hope that's what we are taking away from today. Refocus on our own progress or effort and thrive off of that. So, like I said, you know, actions first, actions of confident actions first. Those feelings will come later, uh, and that's easier said than done. Granted, uh, but if it, little by little, uh, and I hadn't even counted the years. I didn't realize it was eighteen. Who, but you know, little by little, it, it will start to sink in. It will start to sink in. So uh, keep that in mind. Focus, focus on what you're doing. Focus on the task at hand. Don't think about, well, maybe I could do better. You probably can, but that doesn't mean you're not doing, you know, a good job right now. So we are all STEM people. <laughs> And you know, I believe everyone here is probably a math major, maybe a double major, um, and that's great. Uh, but STEM, STEM, STEM majors are extremely versatile. You gain a, a number of skills as a, as a STEM major. Uh, you know, you certainly problem solve every day. Uh, innovation, you're creating uh, new solutions, creative solutions to hard problems. Uh, you're adaptable, you're resilient. 
uh, you communicate and maybe you don't communicate as well, but you can oftentimes communicate through, you know, writing out a solution uh, and collaboration. Certainly there's a lot of that in, in uh, STEM and certainly in math. Uh, so, you know, no knock to any other majors, uh, but I, I, I personally, you know, have an affinity for uh, STEM majors because, you know, you seek to enhance your knowledge, to learn, to understand complex subjects, uh, and to expand, you know, the bounds of our field that, you know, it's easy to say, mm, that's for somebody else. I'll let somebody else do the hard stuff, but you are willing to dig down, get into the trenches and do the hard work. And, uh, you know, STEM and math are transforming, transforming sectors of cybersecurity, safety, uh, health and medicine, national security and transportation. Uh, so, you know, you're really doing a whole lot as a, as, a, as a STEM major, especially as a math major. And, you know, math is the foundation of all STEM. So, I mean, that's pretty impressive. So the fact that you're doing this is pretty impressive. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, says the following. Mathematics is the foundation, technical foundation for science, engineering, and technology. And there's a STEM 101 uh, introduction to tomorrow's jobs. It's a little 11-page uh, pamphlet, if you will, um, promoting um, STEM jobs. And so they point out that mathematics often involves uh, finding patterns in data and abstract logic. Uh, uh, these patterns are often used to draw general conclusions about data uh, and to test mathematical relationships and to model the real world. And so these are things that you already know, but just know that as you are completing your degree, as you are looking for opportunities, whether if you're looking at graduate school or if you're looking at going into a career immediately, uh, that you have what it takes to be really successful because you not only have the skills, these uh, inherent skills that come with being a math major, you also have very valuable skills that are in high demand and high need, uh, especially uh, in the US. So today I really took the assignment as really one of uh, brand building. And for, for today's uh, discussion, you know, I'd like to think of what we're doing is, you know, building our personal brand. So uh, again, this is a book that I've just had a chance to peruse. I have not uh, read the entire book, but I thought she had some really great things to say, in particular, focus on projecting a consistent message throughout all channels to shape your image and strengthen your brand. And we'll talk about image and whatever that means uh, to you uh, and what it could mean to you. Um, the stronger one's personal brand, the quicker one's pers the person becomes, uh, comes to mind when you think of a certain topic. Uh, and I think that's even one of the reasons why I was invited to, to um, you know, speak uh, during this series is because I've had a chance to share my story uh, leaving academia and successfully uh, transitioning out of academia is, is something that people want to know about and people want to hear about. And the fact that I've been able to do that and, and uh, been successful at it makes people want to come and know more about it and they come to me. <laughs> so that's part of my personal brand. Uh, and so, you know, you have the opportunity to control your own narrative, to tell, your, uh, to tell and project your own story. Uh, and but be mindful of that final goal. What are you trying to get to? Okay. So Kansas State University Career Services and your universities uh, will also have career services. So they may not have specifics on personal brand building, uh, but there are other career services, professional development uh, type opportunities. So look into your schools. Uh, career services, even if it's just visiting the website. I think you'll find some great uh, gems of knowledge there that will help you as you're starting to uh, look forward in, in your career and like I said, developing your personal brand. So in this case, uh, they said it's important to share who you are and what you have to offer to an employer, in this case, uh, an employer, uh, to create a brand for yourself. You are the product, you are marketing to a potential buyer the employer. So buyers are kind of weird, right? Because <laughs> we don't sell people. Um, but uh, 
you know, we get the gist of what they're trying to say here. Uh, and so two resources that they provide, um, there's a list of uh, the ultimate personal branding, ultimate guide, A and Z uh, that's given there, and there's some links. Uh, and so you should check, check those out. Um, the, the point is, is that, you know, you have to think about who and what I'm trying to project to the world. Uh, growing up in LA, um, you know, the entertainment capital of the world, I had the chance to participate in a commercial. It was a national commercial, AT&T commercial. Uh, I was in a choir, well, I sang in the choir in my church, and the church was invited to participate in this commercial. Um, and, you know, you get used, you it, being in that environment, you would get used to uh, being on camera, right, and pre presenting a certain image because, um, you know, it, entertainment, There's it's about imagery, right? There's things that people are presenting, and if you see them on Instagram, maybe they have the same image, but then if you see them in person, maybe it's not the same, it's not as great, um, but being in that entertainment industry exposure, uh, for me, helped to think about how people, you know, um, might, you know, look and uh, you know, observe and, and take in the world around them. So I learned from that, it's like, okay, well maybe this is an opportunity for me to present myself in a way and control what people, how people might view me. Now I can't control what they think, but I can control other things that at least might help me shape the story that I'm trying to tell with my life. Um, so, Keeping in mind, all of what we're talking about today will, again, tie into you presenting uh, your personal brand. Uh, Rutgers University, their career services, uh, in terms of identifying your brand attributes, who are you? You know, what are you bringing to the table? Uh, these are great uh, questions to ask yourself. Um, what are your strengths? Now, one of my strengths is overcoming obstacles and uh, grit and sticking things out, uh, sticking it through a difficult, difficult situations, uh, resilience. Uh, th so those, that's part of my brand. Uh, what do you value most? Uh, you know, values vary, right? There are no right or wrong values. In fact, in the Confidence Gap book, uh, there's a whole list of values. And, um, you know, some are about, you, you value, spend time with your family. Um, some values, one value is that you may put in extra hours at work because you're really focused on improving your, um, your organization. Uh, so no values, values aren't necessarily right or wrong. They're just different. Um, what are you passionate about? I have found for me, and I do try to share this with others, but I found that when I try to do things in my career and in my personal life, to help others, that passion to help others has paid off more so than I just am if I'm doing things for myself. Uh, and so that's one of my passions to say, I want to be able to help others. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons why I left academia um, is because I wanted to use my math in a way to have a, a broader impact, to impact those people who might never ever set foot in my classroom, uh, but that my mathematical skills and knowledge can help improve their lives. And so that was something I was passionate about, so much so that I changed careers. Uh, what makes you unique? Uh, well, this type of activity, you know, following my passions in this way uh, made me unique as a mathematician. Uh, again, not a knock to anyone. Just because I left academia doesn't mean I don't respect academia. In fact, I was asked recently, would I ever go back to academia? I don't think I will. <laughs> But um, it's a great place to uh, expand the mathematical field. Um, students, it's incredible to have a chance to work with students. You guys are pretty great people. You should know that. Um, and having the chance to mentor and see you grow and flourish uh, is a really great thing. But I found ways to do that outside of academia. So those are things that um, are part of my brand. Uh, and I, I, I would challenge you and encourage you uh, to think about your brand. Even if you are, you know, still on campus, you know, do you want to be the student who's known for being on time to class? Uh, are you the student who's willing to work hard, even though you may have challenges 
uh, with a particular uh, topic. Uh, you know, just define, determine and define your own brand. And these are ways you can do it. Oops, sorry about that. Okay. Um, so there, that's that. So we talked earlier about the rules of the game. And professionalism is one of those rules, right? And I, I hesitated on even presenting this, this term uh, because it, it's, it is such a broad term. And I, I did like this definition, however, uh, and this is from Virginia Tech's Career um, Services Office. Professionalism is, is the conduct, behavior, an attitude of someone in a work or business environment, that's key, uh, and professional leads to workplace success, strong, a strong professional reputation, and a high level of work ethic and excellence. Yeah, yada, yada, right? Um, professionalism can also mean, you know, a, you're in an environment, like I'm a part of the um, executive committee of the Association of Women in Mathematics. Uh, I am a member of uh, the Society of Industrial Applied Mathematics, SIAM. Um, I am, I was a part of the National Association of Mathematicians um, Executive Board. Those are still professional environments, even though they're not necessarily work related for me, right? Um, it's a business environment as an organization. Uh, and so you have, you probably have, maybe you have an AWM uh, chapter on campus, um, but even as a student, I believe your job as a student is to be the best student you can be. So there is a level of professionalism that you would have as a student. Again, you know, showing up on time for class, um, it may feel like, ah, oh, who cares? But trust me, the faculty in your department have their conversations about students and they form opinions about students, <laughs> uh, good or bad, right? And not that you can necessarily define, you know, how they're gonna view you and no matter, you may do everything perfectly and maybe people may not appreciate um, what you are, who you are in your brand. But, you know, if it is, it is standard that you show up on time, right? It is standard as a student to complete your assignments as they're given. Um, it is standard for you to take the final exam. Those are rules. That's a part of learning to play the game. If you don't do those things and people form a bad opinion about you, what else is supposed to happen, right? But if you do do those things and if you are the best student you can be, maybe not, you may not be the top student, but you're the best student that you can be, uh, show up on time, show that you're dedicated and committed to uh, learning and increasing your knowledge of uh, whatever the courses are that you're, you're currently in, that will change how you also see yourself. Uh, and that will help improve your self-esteem as a, as a student, uh, especially as a math student. So, you know, there's, there's, there's different sides to, to, to this. So as we move forward and think about, you know, these program application materials and, and all um, business cards and whatnot, um, keep in mind professionalism. Okay, a person does not have to work in a specific profession uh, to demonstrate the important qualities and characteristics of a professional. Professional can lead to uh, success, and like I said, in a strong and success and a strong professional reputation. Um, I personally try to exhibit professionalism in everything that I do, um, even. Well, not take it back. Not just, I'm, you know, if I'm at home, I'm not trying to be a professional, right? <laughs> I'm trying to be a good wife and whatever that means. Um, because sometimes you just don't want to be a professional all the time. You got to just set it aside. But, you know, if I'm in a workplace or if I'm in, a, in an opportunity like this to speak to you all, I want to be professional because that is who I am. It's the image and brand that I try to uh, depict uh, in my everyday life. So there. So, you know, we all will have the chance. Uh, you mean, you've already done that to uh, be enrolled and admitted to your university or college, uh, but you submit an application. And again, under the umbrella of professionalism, 
you always want to keep in mind the goal of the application. You know, we have the opportunity and the right to be who we want to be. However, that organization who is accepting your application also has the right within bounds uh, to say whether or not the type of um, person they wish to admit or you know accept into that program. Uh, so keep in mind the goal. Keep in mind that you want to uh, be found to have met all the criteria to be admitted into a, this particular program. So if it's summer, if it's a summer program, uh, you know, some STEM summer program, some math uh, research, uh, URE, REU, goodness gracious, REU, uh, research for undergraduates, research experience for undergraduates. Um, you know, you want to apply and let them know that you have taken a certain number of certain type of math courses. Uh, you want to let them know that you're interested in doing research and why. Uh, you know, and so all these things you're going to express in a clear and educated way because that's the goal is that you want to be admitted, accepted into this, you know, REU. Uh, another thing that demonstrates professionalism, uh, and you should keep in mind when you're applying, uh, is to follow the directions. <laughs> Think about that. If you don't follow the directions, what does that say about your potential success in the program? Are you going to be detailed oriented? Uh, you know, if you don't cover all your bases and approve, you're not gonna get it right. Same thing with the application. If you don't follow all the, the directions, you're not going to get the result that you're looking for. Uh, I like to think of a program application um, as similar to preparing your CV or resume, uh, you know, show your personality in certain ways. Um, but if you're applying for graduate school or for a job, you need to keep it simple, easy to read, concise, uh, clear and factual. Uh, you know, and typically you don't know your audience. Uh, so it's better when you're writing this application to uh, take a more, you know, neutral stance. Um, so I'm on the board for, or the selection board for the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, AAAS, Science Technology Policy Fellowship. And there's a uh, candidate applicant statement. Uh, and there's, you know, for graduate school, there's often that type of thing. Well, you know, when you write to a statement like that, you want to think about the values of the organization that you're applying to. Right, and you want to reflect those values in that application materials. Uh, it's you could go in there, shoot from the hip, and uh, not necessarily cover. You know, try to relate and connect to those values, and you may not necessarily get the outcome that you're you're hoping for. And you know, so it's not, maybe it's not. It may not feel like. You want to you want to be all yourself. You want to be authentic to yourself, but you know again you learn, you're playing by the rules of their game, the program's game. You have to, you know, write to their values. So that's that's something you want to keep in mind. So it's again think about your end goal. Uh, so speaking to the values of the program, be knowledgeable about the program and other key aspects. You know, if you're applying to a particular graduate program. And you know that there are a certain set of um, research areas that they, they have that you're interested in, know what those are, right? And if you have one in particular, speak to that. If you know uh, a particular uh, professor that you might wanna work with, speak specifically to those things. Having more knowledge, being knowledgeable, demonstrates professionalism, it de demonstrates preparedness. It shows that you are, you can be the right fit because you are already knowledgeable. You're able, you have that working knowledge as if you are already a part of it. Again, this will increase your success for a, this will increase your chances for a successful application. Um, you know, and, and I mean, I've, I've uh, had the chance when, if I submitted an application and I got an interview, you know, I'd even tie in to, um, if I knew someone, I'd mention that, or if I had some inside information, uh, you know, within reason, right? I'm not just talking about crazy inside information, but I'd mention that um, in during the conversation. Um, again, being relatable, yet professional, 
Um, I mean, I, you know, I can be girlfriend, right? But I may not bring that uh, to, to my application or to my interview because it may not be uh, the right play, right? Play the game. It may not be the right play to, for, for that moment. Uh, but again, um, keeping in mind with professionalism, um, you know, know your audience, write to that uh, in your application. I'm looking, I'm just gonna take a look chat, look at the chat. Anybody, anybody? It's okay. Oh yeah, it is okay to Google and even recycle program words. I love that Lisa and Kimberly. Thank you. That's a great, that's a great piece of advice. Yeah, Google. I mean, you know, there are lots of search engines. I'm not just supporting Google, but uh, yeah, definitely do that. That's really great advice. Uh, again, answer the questions, proofread, uh, proofread and proofread, okay? <laughs> and I think I may have duplicated. I apologize to answer the questions. I think I said that before, uh, but proofread is really good. So I did not do that. I apologize. Uh, I would have caught that sooner. Uh, but again, you're, you're putting your best foot forward, uh, you're demonstrating professionalism, and that's an example of a quality that's viewed as professional. Okay. So be yourself, but keep it professional. Uh, it's again, best to take a neutral stance, avoid slang, uh, and unless you use it really carefully, uh, and you often will use quotations with with slang um you know and, and be honest state the facts if you have have a certain experience share that if you um have done a certain work share that if it's not quite your work don't share that <laughs> or state that you know be clear say i co you know sponsored an activity or um you know you worked along with a group you know, but own your part, be honest about it. If you're dishonest, it's unprofessional. Um, I had lying there earlier and let, lying was just too harsh of a word. I don't want to say that, but not being as forthright and honest uh, is, is, is unprofessional. Um, so let your personality shine through, but keep it at a minimum on program applications. Um, now, again, if you have that little statement, um, applicant statement, you may be able to add a little personality there. Uh, but again, it's kind of hard to communicate that um, in, in a written form for certain applications. So, you know, find a balance there. Uh, again, I do really well <laughs> in an interview, in a face to face or even virtual, um, but my application packets are, are pretty straightforward, right? I don't necessarily get to show all of that sparkle in my application. Uh, but again, know your audience uh, and you know, if creativity is a criteria, you know, show that creativity there. But again, keep it within the bounds of professionalism. Uh, email communications. And so I recall, maybe this is the case still, I don't know. Um, in middle school and high school, I learned to write letters, right? You have the block form of a letter, you know, you know where to put the, um, the date and the uh, addressee and the address and all that. So th those kind, that kind of format, I think easily uh, translates to emails. Uh, so, you know, if you don't have that experience, you can look it up, how to write a letter. Um, but err on the side of caution. Again, know your audience. Uh, oftentimes you may not know your audience that well, or if you're sending an email, you have a certain goal in mind, a certain outcome that you're looking for. And so keep, in, keep that in mind, the same way you would write your um, program application, um, you know, you know your audience. If, they're, if you're writing to the graduate coordinator uh, who's gonna be reading the, the application or the email, you know, you want to present yourself in a certain way. Uh, keep in mind the purpose and goal. Slang, again, slang is tough, right? And you may not even know what slang is that you use frequently, uh, but just be careful. And if you're not sure, uh, have somebody, you know, proofread or read uh, uh, over your email or application before you send it. Um, the, the level of formality you might use if you were emailing the university president might be different than you use if you're emailing the graduate coordinator. And it's certainly going to be different if you email your grandmother, right? So uh, know your audience and be careful uh, with that. So, I mean, I, at work, I may, um, 
email someone. In fact, I did. I had, this is a great example. I emailed uh, a high level person because I was looking for information from a broad perspective. And he um, responded, which I was really appreciative of, um, but he CC'd a good number of folks who I did not expect uh, because he wanted to get their you know, input. Uh, which I appreciated, however, it was unexpected. So keep in mind that you never know how your email, uh, electronic communications might be utilized. <laughs> so it's better to err on the side of caution and you know, keep it cute, sis, right? Keep it cute, keep it professional that if anyone was to take this email, there's no way they can just take it out of context because I'm very clear and professional in my you know, email correspondence. So. Um, Keep that in mind. I always say be respectful as well. Uh, use the proper, um, um, what are the words? Oh my gosh, it's slipping my mind. Um, and someone's probably saying it in the chat. Um, titles, right? If it's, if it's doctor, put doctor on there, right? Don't, no miss. I've gotten lots of miss and I hate it. <laughs> um, so, you know, make sure to cover uh, the, the greetings properly. Uh, and keep in mind, emails are not text messages. So the same kind of casual approach you might take to a text, text message, uh, you should not take for an email. Uh, websites. So I don't have necessarily a website. I suppose you could say I have my Instagram or my Facebook uh, accounts or, or websites of a sort. But I, so I don't really have one. But uh, when I have viewed others, uh, I would say consider the content is this your professional website or is this your personal website? Um, you may try to keep them disassociated and that if your personal website you wanna be, uh, you wanna express all your political opinions and um, you know how you view the world. And if it doesn't necessarily, uh, is it, if it's not necessarily popular, you know, people may form opinions about it uh, and you can't always control those opinions. You may say, oh, well, it's separate than my personal life, I mean, from my professional life, and that's fine, but people can, you know, associate the two. And so you, know, you may not always be able to control how people view you if they see one or the other. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, I personally uh, just try to limit, uh, you know, my online presence as much as possible. And in fact, someone created a Wikipedia page about me. I did not create it. It's, I tried to edit it and not change whatever they, you know, it's, it's, it's true, but it's, it wasn't my idea, that's all I can say. But just keep in mind that you may not always be able to control uh, what's out there, or people, I'm rather people's response to what's out there. Um, so, you know, so, save some things. If, it, if it's a professional website, if it's your website for work, or if as a student, you're on a project and you create a website, you know, keep it professional, right? Some things are better suited for social media and not your um, professional website. Again, you never know um, how people might um, view the information that you're presenting. Again, keeping in mind, what is your brand? What are you trying to project? Uh, professional photos. So here are two photos of me. <laughs> one you've seen, uh, and this other one is a little older one. Um, these are examples of an official photo, if you think about it, um, not to compare myself to the president or vice president, uh, but you've seen they have similar pictures. There's always an American flag back there. Um, the reason why I have professional attire on in these official photos is because that flag behind me requires me to present myself with a certain level of decorum right? Um, because of who I am representing. I'm representing you all as, as the citizens of the and residents of the United States. Uh, and so I try to present that uh, in this picture. Uh, so you notice I'm, I keep my styling a little more conservative. Um, I have a little bit more jazzy side with the red, with the red uh, blazer on, but uh, you know, you don't always have to, you know, if you can be jazzy, you know, be yourself, but certain professional photos may lend themselves to different kinds of approaches. Um, you'll notice, and this can go for um, any, any person, um, you know, my jury is relatively simple. I think on the, um, uh, the in the, the black uh, blazer, you know, I have pearls on, 
Um, so that's a lot more conservative, right? Uh, and I have different jury on the other one. So, you know, keep things simple. Again, know your audience. Uh, some people choose to, uh, if they have piercings or visible tattoos, you know, they may adjust those uh, depending on the picture. But again, what are they trying to present? Um, not saying you should cover up and, and remove anything. Uh, but again, you are setting your brand. And if you feel like that may not per present what you want, people to take away from that picture, then you may think about um, options. You know, neat hair. I'm not saying if you have purple hair or you have a really cute, uh, you know, cut that's kind of out there, you know, rock it, represent, right? But if it's a professional photo, maybe um, you style down other parts, right? Maybe if you have that mohawk, that faux hawk or whatever, you may, um, you know, rock that, but maybe you have a black blazer on, right? Or something to kind of balance the, the photo. Uh, you may also want to use different backgrounds. Uh, what I really wanted to show you these next couple of pictures. Uh, I have used all of these uh, as professional photos at times. Uh, now this black and white one, you know, it's kind of a cute sassy photo. <laughs> it's an old picture, but um, you know, I didn't necessarily use it for a math related picture. Uh, so it wasn't that kind of professional picture, but I've used it where people have publicly seen it, right? Um, in the middle, I was invited to do this photo shoot to, uh, for the uh, AAAS uh, Science Technology Policy Fellowships. I went I went to Talbot's for that matter. And I asked the woman to help style me, right? Because I wanted to have a certain image for, for the, um, the photo shoot. And this last one, at, we're outside of the park. My husband took these pictures for me. Uh, this was me leading up to um, accepting the congressional fellowship. Uh, and so it, I use it as a professional picture, even though it's not you know, in, a, in a suit, right? I'm not in a blazer. Um, so there are ways that you can have a professional photo and not necessarily uh, be buttoned up, right? I have a blazer on today because I wear blazers, <laughs> especially if I'm giving a presentation. I like to be pulled together in a certain way. Um, it may not be for everyone, but you know you should be neat. If you have a, a shirt on, it shouldn't be wrinkled. Uh, if you if you can neaten your hair in a way, not necessarily you have to make it conservative, but neat should be a goal. Um, if you wear makeup. Um, make sure it's applied properly um, and tastefully. Uh, again, professionalism, often it's related to a business and professional environment. Okay. Uh, time is flying by, okay. Business cards, uh, again, you're presenting uh, image, you're presenting your brand, uh, use easy to read fonts, keep the information professional. If it's a professional, if it's a work-related business card, if it's not a work-related business card, if you're presenting um, your, um, not calligraphy, if you're presenting your, your um, food prep, you know, new company, you, you may have a different kind of uh, style on your, your business card, but that information, people can't read it, they can't contact you, right? So keep the information uh, and logo simple. And, and again, I use the word professional way too many times in this slide. Uh, but the point is you want, pe you want to be able to communicate a message uh, and people can't really get that on a little small card if it's really too busy. Uh, uh, another quick thing before I move on from this, there are a number of office supply stores that have a quick immediate turnarounds for business cards and they have templates. Uh, and so check that out. Uh, I, while we have not been meeting in person over the last year and a half, uh, I have in the past, whenever I've attended a conference, I'd keep a stack of business cards in one pocket and all new cards in another pocket. So I'd hand one out and I'd usually receive a card. Uh, it's a great way to network. Uh, and so keep, keep, keep those business cards in mind when we get back uh, out there with our conferences in person. So we've alluded to this uh, throughout and I can't say it enough. <laughs> Um, your online presence, again, you are presenting a brand. You are representing yourself to the world. Um, is it worthwhile getting involved in controversial discussions? Maybe it is, okay? Um, you can, but you can waste valuable time and preoccupation on comments and thinking of responses to, you know, a situation that may not even be useful. We've heard of uh, internet trolls, 
uh, people, some people just like to get you riled up for no good reason. <laughs> and then, you, you know, if they do it well enough, they'll catch you on, you know, catch you off and catch you on the bad side. And then that's the new image that people have of you. So um, I found it useful for me to, you know, not necessarily engage a whole lot. Like on Facebook, if someone starts talking crazy on my Facebook page, <laughs> Uh, either I delete the post because I don't want to keep it going, or uh, I say something very polite and respectful uh, to tell them to buzz off in a nice way, right? Um, but I don't know if it's necessary to react to criticism in that form uh, online, right? Because you, again, you cannot always control how people will take the information beyond what's on that screen. Uh, so be intentional rather than being reactive. And again, always stay on brand. Everything lives on with social media, just like everything can live on with an email or a text, you know, less is more, especially if you don't have a clear perspective. If you're just all over the place, maybe social media is not for you, right? <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I have found that I've benefited more by not putting so much on social media. Some employers over the years have started to look at uh, student applicants' uh, social media accounts. Um, so either uh, set your privacy settings differently, or uh, and I'll even say not or and you know just just don't post everything on social media. It does not need to be on social media. If you need to send it, uh, share with someone, share with someone you know in a text, send it directly to them. But some things don't need to be on social media. That's just my opinion. Right. <laughs> um, but again, I always try to show respect, even if I disagree with the person, uh, I sh try to show respect um, because, again, it's my brand. I try to be respectful to everyone. That is my brand. Um, again, I can't control how people might take it, but I know what I put out. Uh, there's a proverb that says, even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. You've seen lots of people, hmm, mm, and they seem really smart, but they never say anything, right? But that one person who's always got something to say, <laughs> you say, oh, maybe they're not as smart as I thought they were. Um, and there's another one too, I don't know who said it. They said Abraham Lincoln said it, but then some other sites said, no, he didn't say it. But it says, better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and to remove all doubt. So that's a pretty good one too. So that let that you know be your lesson today for social media. Uh, you don't have to be the fool. You don't have to play the fool. I know there's a song that says, everyone plays the fool sometime. You don't have to be the social media fool anytime. Uh, so there was a specific question that came uh, to the, um, the forum and I wanted to address um, a couple of them um, before we end um, and go into the additional discussion. Uh, so in the spirit of Pride Month, how do you think we can encourage and protect authenticity for people whose identities may be a liability for them? And then for example, that says the trans community. Uh, and I'll say this, I think all underrepresented groups in the math community face this issue oftentimes. Uh, so I'm going to speak from my experience on uh, being a black woman in cisgender woman in the math community. It ain't easy. <laughs> and I, I think that if you give yourself that grace to say, I know I'm in a tough environment and I may not, I, maybe there's an opportunity for me to stick it out. Maybe the department is friendly, but this one person I'm trying to work with isn't the best fit for me. Um, you know, as a research lead, then maybe I find someone else. Um, but, you know, you, you have to be able to separate work from your personal life to say, even if this moment or even this semester and this experience is not working out, it does not mean I am less than. And so it's a lot of internal talk that you have to really approach yourself, that in, internal encouragement. Uh, and if, if you're not good at that, find some folks who will help help you do that. Um, I'm a part of a community of women uh, called EDGE, Enhancing Diversity in Graduate Education. 
And we like to call ourselves a sisterhood. We have all kinds of folks, black, white, um, Latinas, uh, and there are, I'm sorry, there are male edgers, but they're not necessarily, how could I describe them? They've been like program participants in terms of coordinating the program, but not necessarily participants in the program because it's only for women entering PhDs in math. Um, but I found opportunities to you know, connect with people who support me. And you may have to find that for yourself. And then you may not find that within your department. You may not find that at work. Um, because again, those are professional environments. You may not find what you need there. And so it means that you may have to find that community, that support outside of that professional realm. Uh, and so, you know, don't look at your at whatever you're bringing to the table as a liability. It, it may feel like it because uh, the person, you know, is, is giving you a really hard time, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a liability to you when you lay down at night to say who I am and how, if I'm special and worthy enough to, to make it to the next day, it's because you are, and it has nothing to do with the environment that you're having to work in. Uh, and the other question before, and I'm almost out of time, I think I may be out of time, and I apologize, Pam. Um, so the other question is hanging on, uh, it has been my observation that talented minority mathematicians are, female mathematicians are driven out of research academia, even though they may find a way to remain as part of the larger mathematical sciences enterprises, enterprise by, for example, holding a primarily teaching position or holding a management position. It is hard to do competitive research in these positions. Even So even though such women may find it find a way to staying in math, they're effectively outside the smaller research arena. Uh, the smaller, this smaller research arena is what we need to build up. What do you think, in a, what do you think is a way for women to stay in the smaller research arena? Um, and I thought about this, the best way to stay in that smaller arena is to create your own smaller arena. <laughs> um, if there is a, particular math field that you're working in, you know, some kind of topological algebra or what I don't know, right? Um, create your own and folks will come um, who, you know, like I said, you may have to find your own community of support. You may have to create your own space, um, but that is really, um, you, you may not be able to change people quick enough to get what you need. So you may have to create your own. Is what I would say to that. And to that end, I have run my mouth long, long, long enough. I'm going to stop sharing and